Hey guys, this is Coach Ross, World History. Today we're going to be focusing on European imperialism. Alright, before we get started with Africa, I want to kind of set the stage with what is going on in Europe. So uh, there's lots of nationalism and unification going on. So nationalism is basically extreme pride in one's country. Typically, nationalists were not loyal to kings, they were loyal to their people. And initially, rulers saw nationalism as a force of disunity because of the French Revolution. Um, but over time, they kind of figured out that they could use nationalism to their advantage. And so you start to see uh, people in the German Confederation and in the Italian uh, city-states to start to push for unification. Unification means the mergers of politically divided but culturally similar lands. So for Italian unification, Cavour and Garibaldi. Cavour was the leader of the strongest Italian city-states of Genoa and I'm sorry, Piedmont and Sardinia. All right, and he pushed for um, unification through diplomacy. Uh, Garibaldi was the leader of the southern states. In Italy, uh, but the problem was in northern Italy they were under control of the Austrian Empire. All right, and so they eventually um, went to war and they defeated the Austrian Empire in 1860, resulting in the Italian unification. For German unification uh, in 1848, the Germans wrote a liberal constitution. And in 1861, a guy named Otto von Bismarck, all right, this guy right here, uh, was elected as uh, prime minister of Prussia. Now, von Bismarck was one of the greatest polit politicians of his time, and he fought a series of wars ending in 1867, and that ended up with Germany unified. So, causes of European imperialism. Imperialism is a policy of extending a country's power and influence through diplomacy or military force. So, what caused this European imperialism? The Industrial Revolution. It's what we just learned about. Um, and really, uh, Europeans needed a massive amount of raw materials or resources in order to fuel the Industrial Revolution. And so, they turned to Africa because of its massive size and amount of land and resources. All right, so let's look at the true size of Africa. Most people, when they look at a map, they think Africa is about the same size as like South America, but in reality, it's much, much larger. There are 18 countries that can fit within the borders of Africa. It's a huge continent. And when you look at the ethnic groups and the people who live in Africa, you can tell by the map on the left that it is very diverse all right there's lots of different groups of people who live there and this is kind of a spoiler alert for the rest of the lecture but the Europeans really didn't um, take much issue with who was living there when they drew the lines there there's uh, lots of um, the lines that go straight through the middle of ethnic groups so one of the questions I want to ask is, why did it take Europeans so long to explore Africa? When you think of how did the Europeans explore North America or South America for Africa, it's an interesting question. Um, one of the reasons is because Africa has very difficult rivers to navigate. Um, however, with the Industrial Revolution, you have steam engines that come about, um, and they're able to power through the rivers. They, they don't have to rely on the currents or the winds uh, in order to travel through Africa's interior. Also, Africa's geography is very difficult. If you remember from world uh, geography, uh, the topography of Africa is almost like a plate that's upside down. Towards the coast, it's very, very flat, and then it goes up steeply, and it's almost like a huge plateau. And so that makes it very difficult to travel to the interior. <clears throat> also, what made traveling into the interior of Africa difficult is diseases, specifically malaria. And <clears throat> this is a disease that is extremely difficult to 
um, avoid. It's caused by mosquitoes. Um, but in the early 1800s, uh, Europeans developed a medicine for it called quinine, and that uh, protected them from the malaria disease, and so they were able to uh, travel to the interior. Also, um, Africa had its own internal trading network. They were not dependent upon European goods, uh, which made it difficult for Europeans to trade. So, when we look at European motives for imperialism, the first one we already mentioned was raw materials. Uh, Europeans needed uh, African raw materials to fuel the Industrial Revolution. Also, there is this false argument going on that Europeans were just socially and culturally and physically more superior than Africans. And this was a theory derived from Charles Darwin called social... Darwinism. And social Darwinism was championed by this man right here named Herbert Spencer. Um, and he was the one who coined the term survival of the fittest. So what were some of Europe's advantages in, in imperializing or colonizing Africa? Uh, one is technology. Uh, this picture right here is of the Maxim gun. It's basically the first automatic machine gun. Uh, typically rifles um, prior to this only shot about six rounds a minute, um, whereas this gun shot like two to three hundred rounds a minute. And so it really... Um, was a technological advantage for the Europeans. Also, language. Here's a map of languages and dialects spoken in Africa. And you can tell uh, just from the map there are thousands of languages spoken in Africa which make it extremely difficult for them to unify and communicate. So even looking at this one little area, there's you know maybe 30, 40, 50 different languages spoken which made it extremely difficult for Africans to unify. And so um, there being that much diversity in languages, Europeans were able to play African tribes off of each other. So the European uh, colonization of Africa was known as the scramble for Africa. And uh, early on, Europeans realized that they needed to kind of sit down and establish rules in order to avoid war with each other. And so this conference was called uh, the Berlin Conference, all right? And uh, the reason why they met is because they wanted to avoid war. And basically what they did was they decided that any European country could claim land by notifying other countries and showing it could control the area. So the map that you see here, they did not get together and they did not divide up the land at this meeting. What they did was to establish the rules for establishing colonies or territories in Africa. So no African countries or leaders were in attendance during this meeting. Um, and by 1914, only two countries were still independent, and that was Liberia and Ethiopia. So in this new age of imperialism, Europeans demanded more influence. This wasn't the colonization of the 15th, 16th century in North and South America. They had kind of learned from their mistakes. By this time, all of those countries are independent, so they're going to demand more influence. So there were several types of control that they used. The two that I want to focus on are colonies and spheres of influence. So a colony is a country or territory governed internally by a foreign power. So um, like the United States, uh, before it was the United States, it was a English colony, and so it was governed by the British government, um, which was a foreign power. Um, a sphere of influence is an outside power controlling trade and investment, all right? And you're really going to start to see that in uh, our next lesson, which is Asian imperialism in China. Um, they also use different types of management. So uh, indirect control uh, was limited self-rule, 
they use local officials, um, and the idea was to kind of train uh, the local people how to rule. And this was used a lot by Great Britain and the United States and Pacific. Also, direct control. So this is using foreign officials. So France was um, famous for doing this. They would bring in French officials to rule in that colony or in that territory. And so there was no self-rule. And the goal was assimilation. Which is basically to get the local uh, colony or people to assimilate into that foreign power uh, style of government or culture. So the legacy of imperialism. We're going to focus mainly on the negative effects, uh, which is the Africans lost control of their land. They lost independence. They did not have sovereignty over their own land. Uh, It was basically in control of the European powers. Also, the division of the African continent. And we already kind of showed you uh, this this graph, but you can see that the lines that the Europeans drew had no regard for the people who were living there. There are several uh, of these lines that go right through ethnic groups um, without regard to the people living there. So you're combining ethnic groups that might not like each other. You're dividing ethnic groups that do like each other. And so it really is a recipe for disaster. Um, also the positive effects, um, by no means outweigh the negative effects, but, um, the legacy of imperialism, um, Europeans did reduce local warfare. They improved sanitation. They built hospitals and lifespan and literacy rates increased. All right. Last slide, uh, Britain and Egypt hang in with me. We're almost done. I promise. Uh, so Muhammad Ali, not the boxer. Um, this guy over here, all right, he was um, part of the Ottoman Empire, and he was uh, charged to rule Egypt. So uh, that is what he did, except he broke away from the Ottomans, and Egypt was an independent country. And Muhammad Ali's goal was to modernize Egypt, all right? And so him and his family ruled Egypt for many years, and their goal was to modernize Egypt. So the Suez Canal was built in 1869, all right? It was a man-made waterway that connected the Mediterranean Sea to the Red Sea. Now, this was a big deal for European powers, all right? Because looking at the map, if you are France or Great Britain, and you want to trade with India or in Southeast Asia or China, you have to travel all the way around Africa, all the way to India. Well, with the Suez Canal being built, you could go through the Mediterranean, which cut your trip in half the time. Um, And so the Suez Canal was paid for uh, by the French, um, but it was built with Egyptian labor. Now, Muhammad Ali's grandson was in charge at this time, and uh, he continued his grandfather's uh, vision of modernizing Egypt, except he ran up a debt of $450 million to the British uh, banks. And so in response to not being able to pay their debt, the the British took financial control over the canal And they eventually ended up taking control over Egypt by 1882. All right, guys, thanks for listening. I know this is a little bit longer than I I probably hoped for, uh, but please make sure uh, you study imperialism and go over all this stuff. It's in your book, Chapter uh, 27. All right, thanks, guys.